So now, let me introduce today's speaker. Ken Fishang is the Gilmore Car Museum's Director of Commercial Operations, and he's responsible for all of the earned revenue at this amazing museum, including its restaurants, the museum store, car shows, events that take place in the museum's ballrooms and meeting spaces. He has spent a three decade career in the hospitality industry in the states of California, Illinois, and in Michigan. Over a course of his career, he's opened two hotels, two convention centers, and built two different destination marketing organizations from the ground up. We're happy to have Ken with us today to tell us all about the Gilmore Car Museum. Go ahead and share your slides, Ken, and we'll take it away. Thank you so much, Bob. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here today, part of the Motor City's presentation. And we'll get the slides up and, and uh, take a look at some pretty amazing cars. Um, first of all, this is what a car show or our Wednesday night cruise-ins look like uh, during social distancing at the Gilmar Car Museum. Um, you can see folks are socially distanced. Our goal this year has been with limited capacity and reduced hours to be able to create a safe venue for people that do want to go out and enjoy um, in addition to the museum space, um, our beautiful historic campus and grounds. A few facts about the museum. Um, we are the largest car museum in North America. Um, as many of you may know, if you've been there or not been there, um, we have over 400 vehicles on display in over 20 buildings on our historic campus, which spans 90 acres. Um, we say we're the perfect place for social distancing because what is six feet but the width of a car? And we're able to really accommodate uh, healthy crowds in, inside uh, our museum too with obviously masks on and, and all the other restrictions. And we even have mask on areas outside. Um, but we've been able to continue to be able to have special events as well on a limited basis, of course. Um, we have seven museums in one, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And as many of you know, we're located right between Chicago and Detroit. <clears throat> the mission at the Gilmer Car Museum is to tell the history of America through the automobile. And we do that by storytelling. Every car has a story and evokes storytelling from our visitors and the people that come to the campus to enjoy um, that history and that story. So let's get into some of the stories and some of the cars um, that we have. And if we're going, we're doing because this is the top 10. Um, can you flip back to that slide, Brian? Uh, the top 10, there we go, top 10 must see cars at the Gilmore Car Museum because this is the 10th program for Motor Cities as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have this beautiful historic campus and, and, as, and I want to show you and start off with our first automobile and the story behind it. The Packard brothers, James and William, uh, were in Warren, Ohio in the late 1800s, and they were pretty technology oriented. They had a electric company and they made light bulbs. And in our main exhibit hall, we're featuring now, um, it's called Legendary Packard, from light bulbs to luxury automobiles. And the way the Packard brothers got into uh, automobiles is they had heard about this newfangled horseless carriage and they were really interested and they wanted to go buy one. So they made about a seven hour trip to the Winton Motor Company to purchase a new Winton automobile. Um, on the drive home, the car broke down repeatedly. It was so bad, the last three miles, the brothers had to haul the car to their house with a horse, kind of defeating the purpose of the horseless carriage. Um, but they thought, well, they took it apart and figured out what was wrong and how to fix it. And so they thought, well, let's call Mr. Winton and, and we can help him out by telling him this. And when they called Mr. Winton, he wasn't very receptive at all about uh, these young kids telling him his car was, was not working right. 
And so he got so exasperated at the end of the conversation. He, he said, boys, if you think you can make a better car, do it. So in 1899, that's exactly what the Packard brothers did. They started as the Ohio Automobile Company. Um, the car you're looking at right now is a 1901 um, Model C runabout. Uh, it was designed very much like a carriage with a horse. As you can see, the early brass era cars were. This car really had something revolutionary on it. It was the first car with a steering wheel and a steering column. So the old tiller was gone with its ability to, when you hit a rut, to smack your kneecaps pretty good. Um, also, another fun feature to this car is the fenders were made out of leather, which was kind of a, 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 an unusual way to do it. This is the old, one of the oldest privately owned Packards in, it's still in existence. Um, the next shot shows a bit, a bit of the interior uh, as well, where you can see the seat and then of course the brass era lanterns with the handles uh, so you could take it with you for lighting when you went and, and how those early cars really earned their name. The next uh, Packard we're gonna talk about is a 1908 Model 30 runabout. Now this car is a special significance because it's one of the first cars that our founders, uh, Donald and Genevieve Gilmore bought and had and used on the property. Um, in fact, when their good friend Walt Disney came to visit, uh, this is a car that, that Disney, Walt Disney would have ridden around in. Um, also, this car has recently gone through a second restoration. Um, when uh, we, just before the pandemic, we took it to Amelia Island and it won first place for best restoration. Now, this was not an inexpensive car. In 1908, this car cost $4,200. Now, when you think about it, in 1908, a Ford Model T was about $300, and this was $4,200. So this was definitely a very high-end car. Another fun fact about the Packard brothers and Packard, um, from 1899 to 1958, when Packard was no more, of all the cars that Packard made, 53% are still on the road today, which is really a testament to how well-made these cars were and how the Packard brothers really focused on quality and became one of the leading luxury car brands in the United States, uh, based out of Detroit, out of the Motor Cities area, and also in the world in the 1930s and 40s. So this exhibit has a whole bunch more of really spectacular Packards, and this is in our main gallery as we come in. So we invite you to come in and view the rest of them. But we've got more cars to talk about in our top 10. Um, that's the interior, once again, of the 1908. And so next, we're going to move to uh, 1902. So this is a spectacular, Smithsonian worthy, unrestored, all original 1902 Thomas motor car. It has very low miles on it. Um, it is, uh, was a recent donation to the museum. Um, and when you look at this car, um, it is pretty amazing to think that the only thing that has been changed on this car since 1902 is the fluids and the tires but look at the tires, not so recently. Um, in the next shot, you'll get a good picture of the front of the car. And as many cars at the time were made uh, in a similar style, uh, like the Cadillac and the Ford, um, and that came out in 1903. Um, but this car was all made out of, the body was made out of wood and the hood as well. So um, it's a really special car and absolutely one of the top 10 uh, cars in our collection right now. Next up, we could be remiss if we didn't talk about the Duesenberg. Um, the Duesenberg brothers immigrated from Germany to Iowa in the, in the late 1800s. They raced bicycles. They were self-taught mechanics, Fred Nagy Duesenberg, and they started building their own car in 1921, uh, the Duesenberg Model A. Um, by night, about seven years later, uh, in, in uh, 1928, 27, um, another 
car, famous car manufacturer, the flamboyant E.L. Cord, got the brother's attention. And he said, boys, we're going to make the world's first supercar. It's got to do three things. It's got to be the most powerful. It has to be the fastest. And it has to last forever. So they moved to Indianapolis and began building the Duesenberg Model J and Model SJs. And these particular cars were extremely powerful. They had 265 horsepower inline eight cylinder engine, or if they were supercharged, it was 320 horsepower. Uh, and they would take this two and a half ton down the road, car down the road at about 114 in second gear. Um, so they were incredibly powerful and incredibly expensive. They cost about $20,000. The Duesenberg brothers built the engine, the chassis, the drivetrain, and then you picked as the buyer of the car, the owner, who you wanted to build the coach. So $20,000, 1929, that's about equivalent to 24 Ford Model A's or three or four American homes. So only the very, very wealthy could afford these cars. And we feel so delighted to be have uh, this dual call Phaeton that was celebrity owned by Buster Keaton and Natalie Talmadge. Um, and they bought it for their son, James. Not a bad present for a son. Um, so next, we move from Indianapolis back into Flint, Michigan, into the Motor Cities area. And this is a really special car. The first, one of the first Corvettes. This is number 26 of only 300 built in 1953. It only came in this color combination. Um, and another fun fact, when you come and see this car, 1953 and 1954, the, the body was hand laid fiberglass. And so you can see all the fiberglass webbing and, in it. And it wasn't until 55 that they switched and, and you've got the, the more smoother uh, finish than what we're used to in, in Corvettes today. Um, so this is a really special car being number 26 of the first Corvettes. Next up, we have to talk about the Checkers. Uh, Bob mentioned Checker earlier and the Checker taxi cabs were so famous from the early 1920s and right up to 1982 when the last Checker was made here in Kalamazoo. Um, checker also had a couple tie-ins with Packard. Um, Ray Dietrich, known as the Michael Michelangelo of design, uh, designed some really beautiful Packards. We have three of them in the museum right now. And he also designed for Checker cabs. And then he also designed the Firebird guitar for Gibson uh, right here in Kalamazoo. So a rich history. There were 17 different car manufacturers and three truck manufacturers that built cars right here in Kalamazoo. And we have many of them in our collection. This particular car is on the second story of the Campania barn. And you'll also see many other cars up there, Romers, um, you'll, you'll see uh, Hanley Knights, uh, Michigan cars in the brass era. So we have a great selection of cars that were made right here in the western edge of Motor Cities. <clears throat> now, we are going to talk about muscle cars a little bit later, but let's, let's switch right now. This is one, really one of the stars of our muscle car gallery. Um, this particular car has an incredible story of how it was found and and uh, you know some you, it, like we said the cars tell the stories but how this car was found and how it was restored this is a 1967 Shelby GT 500 prototype so it is one of one one of one um, very very uh, uh, wonderful and, and a car and, and a great homage to Carol Shelby and and the work he's done and his popularity continues to grow um, with the Mustang and the Shelby uh, brand, particularly with the uh, Ford versus Ferrari movie that was just came out earlier th this year. So we really invite you to come check out um, our muscle car gallery. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about our new muscle car mid-century modern showroom. <clears throat> now, we talked about Henry Ford before. 
for, you know, Henry Ford from 08 to 1927, he really made cars affordable for the masses. He didn't invent the assembly line, but he perfected it. Um, he built over 15 million Model Ts. He made cars affordable for the masses um, you know, with the Model T averaging around $300. Um, and then his son Edson uh, could finally convinced him that he needed to come out with a new model because he was losing a lot of um, sales to the Dodge brothers at the time. And so he, in 1920, late 27, and for the 1928 year, the Model A was introduced to much fanfare and, and a tremendous success. So what the significance is of this particular Model A, it is the very first Model A. And if you go back to the, uh, the slide where the picture is behind, upper left-hand corner, that's Henry Ford stamping number one on the engine block of this car. That's why the hood is open. Um, now, Henry was standing at the assembly line as this car came off as the first car with his good friend, Thomas Edison. And Henry turns to him, he says, Thomas, here's the first Model A and I want you to, I wanna give it to you. So you would think that, you know, Thomas would say, gosh, Henry, this is awesome, that's great, thank you so much. Instead, Thomas looked at it and said, I don't like it, I wanted a Phaeton. Cause it was originally came off the assembly line as an enclosed car. And so Henry sent it back for his friend Thomas and had it made into a Phaeton or an open, open car. And so this is a great story about this, the first Model A. And this was the first of five million as, as Ford went on to become the successful company that they are today um, throughout this era. So in the Model A Museum, we have every Model A model and a whole new dis uh, first responders exhibit uh, happening there too. So when you come to the museum, you can check that out as well, but definitely in the top 10. Next, if there's a wonderful story about Preston Tucker and uh, that Francis Ford Cope turned into a movie and I hope many of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, it is a great movie to watch. Um, this is really one of our top, easily top 10 cars um, because he only built a, about 55 of these. Um, this is this beautiful 1948 Tucker in Waltz Blue is the lowest mileage Tucker in the world. It only has 61, yes, that's 61, 61 miles on it. Um, and it's right now in our exhibit, Women Who Motor, because the interior was designed by Audrey Moore. And Audrey Moore worked with Francis on this car. Now, a couple other key features that, about this car, it had a rear engine, which was a Franklin air-cooled helicopter engine. And that front headlight that you saw literally turned with the front wheels to provide better lighting. Inside the car, it had a padded dash that you see, safety glass. And to the right there is a huge com open compartment in front of the passenger. So because seat belts weren't really uh, in cars yet, uh, the passenger was instructed that if they saw they were getting in a wreck, they needed to dive into that, <laughs> that, that under dash uh, opening there to protect themselves. So, but a beautiful, beautiful car that's part of our Women Who Motor um, exhibit right now out in the carriage house. You can see that. Um, when you come to the museum as well. Next up, okay, Francis Ford Coppola could never have made the movie Tucker if he hadn't produced the iconic car movie, coming of age movie, American Graffiti in 1973. The story was really George Lucas in, uh, who wrote the story about his hometown of Modesto, California. And in, it took place in, in 1962, but it was filmed. He wanted to film it. Uh, Lucas wanted to film it in Modesto, but he uh, could not get the permits. And, and so he ended up filming it in Sonoma County in Petaluma. Um, it was really the springboard for so many famous uh, A-list actors um, like Harrison Ford and, and of course, Ron Howard. This is, when we say the cars are the stars, this is the 1958 Chevy Impala that Ron Howard drove in the movie American Graffiti. And it's part of our American Graffiti new exhibit that we have at the museum. 
So this car was typical of the era. They took all the badging off, so you won't see, it won't say Chevy, it won't say Impala. Um, they did what we call kind of the eyeliner, uh, highlighting um, around those front lights and then down the sides. And the taillights in this were not 58 Chevy, they were 1959 Cadillac. So they really were, it really gave it a custom look with the custom wheels. And, and this is part of our new American Graffiti exhibit um, and many of the cars in this exhibit and our hot rods that go along with this are owned by um, NASCAR famous racer, um, Ray Evernham. And so we're delighted that Ray has uh, let us show these beautiful cars as part of this collection. And when you come into the exhibit, you'll see there's a jukebox playing with music from 1962, a diner table, and you'll see some of the cars that are clones or just like the ones that were in the movie, as well as that 56 Thunderbird that Suzanne Summers was discovered in. There's even uh, a graffiti wall where you can write, where were you in 62, and add to the American graffiti with your own American graffiti. So we invite you to come and enjoy this in our 50s, 60s gallery. Some great cars and great hot rods there. Now I told you we're gonna talk briefly about our new muscle car museum. And this is an artist's rendering of our mid-century modern design that will include both indoor and outdoor exhibit space to really highlight the American muscle car. And it does include, as you saw earlier, pony cars like Mustang, Camaro, and, and others, but we really focus also on the true 1964 to 1974 uh, muscle cars that really brought about a whole new era and attracted a younger demographic uh, back to some of the cars that they formerly thought were probably grandpa, grandma, or mom, dad cars, that, but that were souped up with big engines and racing stripes and a lot of fun. So this is gonna be exciting. We originally were gonna break ground on this this past spring, but then of course the pandemic happened. So um, we're optimistic that we'll be, uh, once we get uh, around some of the challenges that we have right now, um, with the pandemic that we'll be able to get back to um, whatever our new normal is and be able to break ground on this museum in the coming year. So I want to thank you for um, your attention and being able to speak to you and share a bit of what I call my happy place uh, at the Gilmar Car Museum. Um, you know, for those of us that have been lifelong car enthusiasts, it really is an incredible place. And when our visitors come in, we, we always think we never have a second chance to make a first impression. And so we invite you to uh, like, follow, and support us um, on both our, our website, gilmarcarmuseum.org, uh, our Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube channels. And you'll see a lot of wonderful videos, short videos too, about cars in our collection. Um, on that website, as well as we have a new primer video that's showing in our theater. And so thank you so much for the opportunity, Bob, uh, to be able to talk to everybody today. Okay, well, thank you, Ken. And we do have a few questions that have come in. Again, if you would like to ask Ken a question about the Gilmore Car Museum or any of the cars that we have seen, uh, please do use the Q&A. Uh, icon at the bottom of your screen uh, for those of us joining uh, via Zoom. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, we will try to check in on Facebook and see if any questions are left there as well. Um, first question we have um, is from Bill Greenwood. He asks if all of the cars on display are in running order, and if that is the case, do they need to be driven on a regular basis? Great question. Yes, they are. Um, the cars are in running order. When you come in the museum, uh, the main entrance, you turn around and you look and there's a sign on, on, our, on our big, one of our big red barns that says Garage Works. And in that building is also our operations department who keeps the cars running and moves them around. Um, and then our Garage Works program that is targeted at high school students that want to get into the automotive uh, either be a mechanic or be an auto refinisher. And so that's a really cool program that we do. Uh, do the cars need to be driven? Um, not 
all of them know. Um, and we've, we have some that, you know, we have three types of cars in the museum. If it says Gilmar Car Museum on the, the curb sign, then that means we bought it. If it's part of our collection, it'll, or it'll say donated to the Gilmar Car Museum. Uh, it'll say who donated it, unless they want to be, you know, anonymous. And then the rest are cars that are on loan to us from collectors. So um, we also maintain the, you know, whatever needs to be done in terms of the maintenance of the cars for all of our partner museums as well. Okay, excellent. Uh, we have a question from John Dunton uh, asking about the Thomas. Uh, he says, why not tell the story of the amazing durability of the Thomas Flyer? That's a great point too. Uh, and because this car is relatively new to the museum, um, we've been, uh, we definitely could expand upon that. And so I appreciate that comment. Okay. Um, another question from uh, Robert Dagenhart. Um, how is the group doing with the Durant Museum? How are we doing with the Durant Museum? Um, yes. Well, you know, we're right now we're really focused on our expansion with the Classic Car Club of America Museum. And then the, we've got two other projects, the Muscle Car and another project as well that we're looking at. Um, and so right now that's about all we're able to, to talk about currently. So but if there's something more to say, we'll be happy to announce it at the appropriate time. Okay, no problem there. Um, we have a question from John Mills. Uh, descendants of Ray Haroon, the winner of the first Indy 500, purchased a 1919 Haroon manufactured in Wayne, Michigan, which is outside of Detroit. They live in Kalamazoo, and he asks if there's any chance that Gilmore is involved in the restoration of that car. Um, we don't get involved in the restoration. We have folks that work like the uh, Brad Janicek did the restoration on the 1908 uh, Model 30 runabout Packard we talked about earlier. Um, so we certainly work with them, but we do not do the restorations ourselves. Okay. Um, well, we've got a lot of questions that are uh, coming in now. Um, Russ Doré, a Motor City's board member, asks if you would comment on the special buildings that you have for the Model A and Cadillac and others. Yes, um, we have our dealership row and uh, it starts as you walk down the dealership row with the um, Franklin dealership. Franklin invented the air-cooled engine, the first four-cylinder, six-cylinder, 12-cylinder engine and the exterior looks just like a Franklin dealership from the early 1900s. They operated from 1902 to 1935. And then across the street from that is the 1928 Ford dealership. And that dealership features every Model A, as we talked about earlier when we saw the first Model A, but it also has, it's built just like it would have been in 1928 with the gas pumps out front, it has a complete service department and parts department. Um, and our MAFI Model A um, club is just tremendous in terms of uh, keeping that, that display updated continuously. They just put in some new exhibits in addition to the first responder exhibit I talked about earlier. And then next to that, next to the Ford, is the, our 1948 Cadillac LaSalle dealership. And when you look at the architecture, the exterior of this, it looks more like something that could have been in the 80s or 90s, but it was a 1948. And that features, um, that's the Self Starter Club, which is Cadillac LaSalle. And that museum features everything from the very first Cadillac 1903 to modern day. The newest exhibit coming in there is going to be uh, early Eldorados. And then across the street from that is our Lincoln dealership from the late 1920s. Um, once again, featuring Lincolns from the early 20s to uh, modern day concept cars. Down the road from that is the Pierce Arrow Museum and the Classic Car Club of America Museum. So the, our campus, we, in addition, we have 
a shell station that's a turn of the 20th century shell station built uh, in the buildings. We, and the, many of the red barns that you see were barns that Don Gilmer found throughout uh, Southwest Michigan and had them taught them, had them disassembled, brought to the facility and reconstructed. Um, so that, it, that really makes, sets the, the whole campus apart. Um, our main heritage center, um, which was finished in 2012, is designed after the Plainwell Paper Company uh, architecturally. So there's been a lot of thought put into this. And when you come and you see it, you're, I think you'll be really dazzled with, with the authenticity and the history that you get to see, not only in the cars and the, you know, and the other exhibits, but also in the architecture. Okay, well, thanks for that. And you know, if you add any more buildings, you're going to have to start selling two day passes. <laughs> well, we we're, we're, we're trying to we want to become the biggest car museum in the world. Um, and I think we're well on our way with some of the new projects we have coming up. All right, well, we have a question from uh, Stephen. I won't attempt to uh, try the last name. It begins with W. Um, he says, when I was there last, they took out the large turntable in the main showroom. Where did it go? And were you aware that it was from the Ford Rotunda? Yes, and it, we, we had some, uh, some issues with it and uh, not only of you know, maintaining it and keeping it going, but also uh, safety issues too. So that, that is something that has been yeah, gone from the museum for quite a while, for several years. But we're always looking for new and exciting and different ways to showcase our, our cars, which are the stars. Okay, um, another question from John Dunton. Um, can a visitor ride in any of the cars? And he's asking if uh, you would ever offer rides in your Model A's or a Packard. That would be the ride of a lifetime for many of us. Yes, it would. And yes, we have. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, we have a program called Ride the Classics. And we would have on Wednesdays and Thursdays anywhere from six to eight of our cars from our collection. Um, now we have over 400 cars uh, that are out in the galleries. We have about over 100 uh, cars in our storage vaults. So we bring certain cars out for, for that program. Now we were not able to do that with COVID-19. But the other thing you can do is we have Model T Driving School. Now we had to scale that back a little bit this year because of the, of the um, pandemic, but we were still able to conduct 11 classes for the Model T Driving School. And you can go online to the website and make reservations to be part of that. It's a great father-son, grandfather activity or mother-daughter too. We've had mothers and daughters come and learn how to drive a Model T. In regards to the Model A's, um, we have Every, I drive a Model A every Wednesday because we have our 1930 Model A uh, Gilmore Mercantile Exchange. It's our mobile store that we bring out on Wednesday nights for our cruise-ins. Also, we're in the process of obtaining through Mafi, they're restoring a 16-passenger Model A bus that will be part of, the, of our campus and we'll be able to give people rides around the campus once we're able to get out of the pandemic. Excellent. Well, since you're talking about the pandemic, we did have a question about um, what were some of the areas where you had to reinvent the museum um, as a result of the pandemic? Well, the museum itself, as I mentioned earlier, we're pretty lucky. We have over 200,000 square feet of space and, and over 20 buildings. So even if we're right now at 25% capacity, that's 275 people which it's pretty easy for us to get 275 people in and out on a flow basis indoors. Outdoors, um, car shows and uh, cruise-ins. You know, in the opening slide, I showed you what it looks like now. Um, if that was last year, every square inch of space would be packed full. And, you know, we, we had to go through a, with all the different evolution of what was happening, about three or four versions of our car shows. And so we created a new... Uh, a new theme called Summer Saturdays and Summer Sundays, starring, because cars are the stars, so starring motorcycles, starring 
mob, you know, Camaros. And so with that, we had reduced hours instead of, you know, nine to four typical car show day, it was 10 to two. And then we had limited capacity based on uh, the executive orders from the governor. And we've been able to spread people out because we are classified as a park. So just like the Henry Ford, we've got a lot more acreage than many other museums that are indoor only. So that was a blessing for us. Okay, and speaking of all that acreage, uh, we have a comment on Facebook asking to talk about all the hood ornaments. Uh, we do have the world's largest collection of hood ornaments and mascots. Um, the, you'll find them in the main, there's a, a showcase in the main Heritage Center gallery by the Packard exhibit. The largest collection is in the Classic Car Club of America Museum, and then also in our train depot um, on the campus. And the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're blessed to have a ballroom, we're blessed to be able to do, we've done some really successful um, outdoor concerts, drive-in concerts, drive-in events this year, just adapting under the new normal. Okay. And we have a comment from uh, Motor City's board member, uh, Margaret Hare. Uh, she says, thank you to Ken for mentioning that Henry Ford did not invent the assembly line, that he merely perfected it. Uh, and she, of course, reminds us being from the Lansing area that credit for the automotive assembly line goes to Ransom Olds. Broad point, that's true. Also, uh, another question from Bill Greenwood. Uh, are guided tours available only to groups? Guided tours are available to anyone that would like one. Um, we typically ask for a donation to the museum for that, but we have docents that are on duty um, at the museum um, as well as myself. I'm one of the, I train the docents and so we're delighted you know, because we believe, you know, with, with the more we knowledge and stories we can share, um, we'll have a whole bunch of, of ambassadors leaving the museum, going out and telling people, you've got to go to the Gilmer Car Museum and you've got to experience this place. It's, it's one of a kind. It's amazing. So, yes, we loved doing tours. Okay. A um, couple more questions that I have spotted. Um, are there any foreign makes? Uh, Citroen, Peugeot, Volvo, any of those? We, as, as we said earlier, we really tell the story of the American automobile. However, we do have in the Classic Car Club of America, they feature luxury cars from around the world. And then we also have uh, some Rolls Royces in our collection as well. Um, Classic Car Club has uh, Jaguar, Delahaye, um, Rolls Royce, and but we mainly focus on car brands that were Motor City centric or America centric. Okay, thank you for uh, clarifying that. Um, we have a this is kind of a question about the um, area adjoining uh, the Gilmore Car Museum. Um, any news regarding a local motel or old fashioned tourist style cabins or um, hotel convention center facility uh, coming near the museum? Well, yes, we, we've done a, we, we've worked with a, an organization that was uh, part of the vision, vision, uh, Disney Visioneers. And um, in terms of planning the whole total campus, um, obviously, right now is no time to be thinking of hotels. However, um, what we were able to do um, about two weeks ago is we have primitive camping on site. And we had a, like we called it a silver city because we had a group of Airstream uh, trailers there. For, they came in and camped with us from Wednesday to uh, Sunday and got to enjoy several different events that we had going on at the time. And we're looking, as we look to the future, yeah, we, we really want to have more rooms closer by. And we think that the idea of expanding the camping options, uh, whether it's through um, you know, lodges or Airstream trailers uh, and on other options, um, is definitely something that we're looking into doing right now. But currently, if anybody wants to come and camp there, you can do it. 
and, and we welcome you to come and we have electrical hookups for about 10 sites and um, we're happy to, to work with any group that wants to come and, and uh, spend the night or two or three or four. Okay. Uh, one more question came in from Bill Greenwood. Um, I understand you guys are the largest car museum in North America, right? Correct. And so what is the largest car museum in the world and how does it compare in size to Gilmore? Um, it's located in France, the Cité, and it has um, 550 cars out on display. And we have 400 plus, uh, well over 100 in our in our vault that are not out on display. So I think the minute we hit over 550 out on display, they may be expanding and we'd have to expand again, but we're, that's where we're looking at in terms of total size and number of cars on exhibit. Okay, I think, um, I think we've exhausted the amount of questions that we found. I've noticed a great deal of positive comments as well. Lots of people mentioning uh, how much they enjoy the Gilmore, have, how many people have been there, uh, mentioning you know, some of the cars that you selected in your top 10. Uh, so thank you so much, Ken, for being with us today for Motor Cities at Home. And uh, hopefully uh, many of our our viewers will be able to join you out at the Gilmore sometime very soon. Well, Bob, thank you so much for the great work that you guys do at, at the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. And we so appreciate and value being your Western uh, Edge partner. Welcome people in uh, to this wonderful area and the great history behind that. So we appreciate it and we hope to see you soon at the Gilmore Car Museum. All right, well, thank you so much and uh, we're going to uh, wrap this up, but before we do, uh, Motor Cities at Home is going to be taking a break for a few weeks. Uh, we have three weeks coming up of our Lunch and Learn series, uh, starting next Wednesday, October 7th, uh, starting at noon. Uh, that session is going to be focusing on archiving basics and collections preservation uh, for our friends that are in the museum business, uh, local historical societies, uh, general collectors and, and, and such. Uh, and we have an excellent panelist who is going to be doing the presentation. He is Mark Harvey. He is the state archivist with the Michigan History Center and the archives of the state of Michigan. So uh, you can sign up for that at motorcities.org. There is a tab at the top of the homepage for our 2020 Lunch and Learn series. So we hope to see uh, some of you there next week, Wednesday, October 7th. In the meantime, thank you so much for uh, being with us today for Motor Cities at Home number 10, for all of our friends on Zoom, as well as on Facebook Live. Uh, have a great Wednesday, and we will see you probably later in October or in November with more editions of Motor Cities at Home. Thanks again.